All right. We will go ahead and get started. We've got a bunch of stuff to cover. And uh, yeah, we'll get going. So welcome to the Scythe Hands-On Purple Team Workshop. So if you've joined us before, then uh, welcome back. So we've rearranged uh, a little bit of the presentation here at the beginning to include a few new topics, like uh, talking about sort of an introduction to some detection engineering and how you'd incorporate that into your purple teaming. And then we've also uh, done a, a short introduction to that kind of uh, topic also in the lab. So let's go ahead and dive in. For those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Tim Schultz. I am the adversary emulation lead here at Scythe. So prior to Scythe, I was at uh, Sandia National Laboratories and MITRE. So you may be not so familiar with Sandia, but also like everyone in this space, it seems, is uh, pretty familiar with MITRE these days and MITRE attack. And so uh, I'll be covering that a little bit later. And hopefully uh, you all can uh, you know work with us on this because as I mentioned, we do have some new content and things like that. It's always sort of an interesting thing to introduce new content and new labs because there's always like unexpected things that pop up, stuff like that. So what I'm going to ask from you as participants is to give us feedback. So if something's not working, you know, if there's a specific type of contact that you'd like to see me deep dive into in a future workshop, we do this at least once a month. And so I want to make sure that, you know, this content's relevant to you and what we're presenting is something that resonates. So that is something I will ask is give us some feedback. Let us know what's working, what's what's not. So we'll take all feedback under consideration, I promise. Uh, and we'll try and do our best to incorporate what we can. So with that, as far as the actual format here, so we do have individual lab environments for you that are built out on the VMware learning platform. So uh, you should get an email with a unique uh, URL. And if not, then uh, you know, let us know in the chat. Just either do a chat or uh, you can pop something in the Q&A. This is sort of how we are going to troubleshoot these things. I've got some coworkers that are helping me on the back end to make sure that all of our participants are able to get up and running. And so once you do get that, you can click on the URL. It gives you this like quick launch thing. It's going to pop up this box that asks you like which class or something you want to take. Just click X. Um, it pops up every time and that's always a question we get. So I'll just ask everyone, go ahead and just exit out that first one. And then it's gonna take a few minutes to build because it's like four different systems here that we're using. And we'll sort of dive into that a little bit later. But the key thing here is that our workshop's really broken into two different distinct parts. The fir first is sort of a lecture format, takes probably an hour uh, to an hour and change. And then we're gonna dive into the lab. So the lab does have a self-paced manual. So if you want to dive straight into that and throw me on mute or something like that, you can do that and go play around with it. Or you can stick with me, learn about purple teaming, learn about all the concepts that we use in our own purple teaming engagements here at Scythe. And then I will walk through it uh, after the lecture portion. So you have three total hours to play in the lab environment that in, and so, starting basically now until three hours from now. So I'm on Eastern time, it's noon. So at 3 p.m. Eastern, it's going to, all of the labs are gonna be be done. So that's something, questions we always get, how, off, how long do you have? You have the length of the workshop to play around with it. So in addition to some of the infrastructure that we've got set up, we also have like the sand slingshot uh, C2 matrix edition. And so this has a bunch of command and control frameworks, a lot of them open source that uh, are pre-installed. So thanks SANS for that. We've also installed a uh, vector in that, which we'll be covering in the lab. And then recently we've added uh, ELK to it. And so that's where we're hosting Elasticsearch and Kibana. And so that's, uh, we're also going to dive into that. So I just want to let you know about those are the four major things that we've got in the lab as far as the system to play with. It's sort of a you know mini mini environment for you all to use Scythe in as well. So uh, yeah, let's dive right into it. So the key takeaway that I really want you to like bring with you after you've 
taking this class is learning about what purple teaming is and how you can bring it back to your organization. So obviously we're sort of a purple team company and so we're, we're huge advocates for it, but also what we've released uh, over the course of blog posts and talks and things like that, and especially with these workshops, is trying to equip you with the tools and knowledge you need in order to bring it back and use it in your organization because all of the different purple team exercises and things like that that we've been able to do here at Scythe we've seen huge improvement in the defensive posture in validating uh, different detections and the security team's processes when trying to deal with ransomware, for instance. And so that's really what we, uh, we hope that you can take away and take back to your organization. It's not necessarily just that, like the name of a specific tool, although we'd really like you to at least look at Scythe, but also using some of the other, these are all free resources that we'll talk about uh, and so I've sort of talked, uh, or at least given a few of the things you can do with each of them. So the purple team exercise framework, this is something, uh, credit to George Ortiz, who I think is uh, on the call. He's our CTO who built this out. And it's not your typical framework. That's just a, you know, here's some things that you could do. It lays out the roles and responsibilities. It uh, walks through exactly how you can do a purple team exercise. We'll be going through that step by step. And so this is how we always introduce people. Dip your toe into purple teaming, pick a specific one procedure, one technique, and decide to go through a purple team engagement with that. And this shows you how to do it. You can also scale that up. And so that's where we'll talk a little bit at the end about how do we introduce purple teaming into your strategic roadmap for cyber defense. And so that's the purple maturity model. We have a lot of free resources and adversary emulation plans that we've released to the community, which is uh, we've released through our threat Thursdays. So keep on the lookout for that. And then of course we have the Scythe enterprise platform, which is the automation part of it, because as infrastructure and all of the assets and responsibilities of the defensive team have scaled out as new technologies are added to their stack, you need to be able to automate your testing as well. So that's sort of the, the main ways that we've tried to tackle some of those challenges that current teams are seeing uh, in the test and evaluation environment. And so, yes, you will get CPE credits for this. And so it's basically a document at the end of the lab. And so uh, again, always get questions about that. It's, it's a PDF that's right at the end. So once you get to the last one, it shows you exactly how to download that. So let's dive straight into it. What is a purple team? So historically, blue teams have sort of uh, been stood up to provide defense against uh, adversaries. And so with that, of course, we need a team to come stress test. And that's how red teams sort of came to be was those adversary emulators. But part of the challenges that we saw, especially with red and blue teams when they first got stood up is there was a lot of sort of win-lose mentality when it came to those teams interacting. If the blue team stopped the red team, there was question on whether or not the red team brought any value at all because the blue team blocked things. Or as a lot of times what we've seen happen, is that the red team is able to get in because there's a thousand different things the blue team has to worry about. And so they find a hole, they're able to get in, they you know get to the domain controller or whatever their objective is and they're able to achieve it. And it's, oh, we won, we're awesome, we're great. And so that's sort of historically, there's there's been a lot sort of an adversarial relationship between the two teams. And so that's where when we get to purple, we do want to emphasize communication and things like that. And sort of along the way to help with that is in the last, like, I'd say decade or so, this has been an upcoming industry in cyber threat intelligence that has really exploded. Like there are very few companies that did it before, and now we have lots of them. And so what that's done is provided context around the information that the red teams and the blue teams uh, are have been getting. So when it comes to blue teams, you know, indicators of compromise and things like that have traditionally been what people see as cyber threat intelligence. But as we've moved towards behaviors and things like that, reporting on adversary behaviors has become uh, key to new intrusion campaigns and things like that. 
is not just what are the tools that they're using, but what uh, tactics and techniques. And we'll get into attack, which covers those later. But the other key element that cyber threat intelligence has provided in that context is they have provided essentially a scope for the red teams to work in. And so instead of the red team just having the limits you know, of its creativity to figure out how to do an attack, they're scoped a bit and have to emulate adversaries in a way that you would hope that the blue team is going to be able to defend against and possibly what they're going to go against in the real world. So there's sort of a training partner and that's really what they've always meant to be. But cyber threat intelligence really has helped provide additional information that, that has allowed that to be sort of a data-driven approach, which as we've collected more and more data in the world, that's sort of where everything has been driving. And so a purple team is all three of those skill sets that red, blue, and the context or the cyber threat intelligence combined. And so a lot of questions is, okay, that sounds great, but, but why should we do it? Now, I mentioned before that you can train your organization's defenders because it's that training partner, but let's go a little bit into how you can do that and why. When you're training against and, and trying to bring up new people in your organization, it's always a challenge to say, well, when this happened, right? When a breach occurred, when this last thing happened uh, and explaining what people did and how they did things is great. But a lot of times that's not always how everyone learns. And so putting th someone through essentially a scenario or an engagement that simulates or emulates that is going to help train up new people. And so that's where we have the purple team comes in is that the red team can say, here is a very specific type of attack or technique that people have used, we ran it. Like, can you find it? You know, you, now there's known bad data that this person has to go find themselves on. And so we've seen a ton of new information and training in the information security space that has all focused around providing environments, such as this one, uh, where you're going to be able to have people dive in, you know, get their hands dirty and understand exactly how to combat current adversaries. The other thing, testing the processes between teams. This is something that is critical. We, uh, we talk at Scythe about, we need to test the people, the processes and the technology. Everyone thinks about technology and whether something passed failed, right? Did something detect it or did it not? Could we hunt through something or not? But also when doing purple teams, it's critical to evaluate what are those processes that the organization has in place and are they being followed? So whenever we at Scythe do a purple team, one of the things we'll do, especially depending on the size of the organization, but most large enterprises have like a three tier SOC setup. And so when we execute one of our tests, we'll say, all right, like what is that level one analyst? What are they going to do? And they'll say, all right, these, this is the type of information I would see. This is what would cause it to be escalated. And then from there, they would bump it up and say, all right, this is where I would escalate it to the tier two person. And so uh, we're normally using Zoom. And so they swap uh, screen shares. And now that person that's level two analyst is going to look at it. They're going to say what they would do and then whether they would escalate it or whether they would tackle it. That type of process evaluation is super critical. And so that is why purple teaming is so great is you have uh, a lot of transparency that allows for building trust and sort of this fostering a collaborative culture uh, to go to my last bullet point between teams. And so that's, that's what you really want. And we've seen as we've done purple teams that teams have really come together because they like seeing the behind the scenes of exactly the red team gets to see how the blue team goes and looks for TTPs and understands like how detections happen. And then the blue team also gets to understand what the red team's doing and everyone's sort of talking and communicating. That's exactly what you want. And so uh, the last one that I'll talk about uh, here is that preparation and replay of a red team engagement. So uh, while purple teams can answer a lot of questions, there's still scenarios where a blind red team engagement might be extremely helpful to understanding how the organization would do against uh, essentially a real adversary in real time. And so 
After that's done, however, making sure you have the information to replay it, to prep for another one, that goes to that training the organization's defenders. It's not just junior analysts that you're training, but it's also your senior analysts, your principal, you know, depending on your structure, and making sure that they're prepared and have absorbed all of the information and lessons learned from the previous engagement. Because otherwise, the red team is going to be able to abuse the exact same thing over and over again. And at that point, the return on investment when it comes to the test is, is very small. So purple team exercises, uh, as I've already sort of highlighted, are the main way that we've tackled this right now. And at the end, I'll talk about the purple maturity model and how this can sort of morph into something bigger. But this is largely what we're going to talk about is specific exercise where you are putting all the right people in the room. Again, we'll talk about who, uh, but that's really what, what matters is doing an exercise with the intent of it being a purple team and essentially having this ability to be transparent and repeat your exercises to measure and improve, as I mentioned, people, process, and technology. All right, looks like I can share my uh, video now. So you can see my face. So let's first, we're going to dive into a Scythe Purple Team success story. So uh, if you watch George and Bryson's talk at Cactus Con earlier this year, then you may have already seen this story. But this is a really good one because it shows the power of what Purple Teaming could be. And so that's our vision. That's our starting point here is to tell you exactly what you can do with Purple Teaming. So we had a six week purple team exercise that we engage with. It's the National Motor Freight Traffic Association, NMFTA. They were really nice and allowed us to, to name them, to share the data and, and talk about exactly what we did. And as you'll see, like that's, it's great to be able to share that with you so you can hear us talk about a real organization and not necessarily just a made up scenario. Uh, and so our challenge was, Zero dollars could be spent on new technology, could only tune current security controls, and Scythe was hired to perform the full purple team roles, red, blue, and cyber threat and tell. So it meant from red side, designing the tests, blue, you had to design detections, and then the cyber threat intel is determining what threat actors are we going to pick and make sure that those are fed into the red side of testing. So we split it out into six different weeks of tests. The first one being a baseline of just running some initial commands, getting access, understanding what current controls are in place. And then week two is, through five is really where pick specific adversaries. And so when we talk about sophistication here, it's mostly around like operational security is, is one measure of sophistication, uh, not necessarily a success factor. And that's where changing these adversaries up between Chinese attributed and Russian attributed threat actors or Iranian is that it allows for uh, a double check against any like biases of how you're building detections. Because as I mentioned, Scythe was also brought in to be the blue team. And so if you overtune detections to a very specific procedure, then it's going to mean that one of these other behaviors is going to get through. And so that's something that is really important when you are trying to plan these out, especially if you are performing all three roles, is to make sure that you have uh, some variety when you get to your testing and when you're outlining your tests. So we outlined our test here, got it accepted. And the last week it was sort of free play to try and poke any holes based on what we'd seen before. And so that baseline testing that first week was pretty rough. 94% uh, was not detected. And so um, this includes like logging and stuff like that. And so unable to hunt for things that makes life difficult for defenders. And so a few test cases like PowerShell were uh, detected and blocked by current ones, but this was something that moving from like PowerShell.exe to unmanaged PowerShell then meant that that went from detected and blocked to not detected. And so that's where this was our baseline. And this is really important part of purple teaming is it's get it, gathering data and putting it together in a format that you can perform some sort of measurements against. 
because as you'll see here, when we get to week six and went through everything, the key thing being enabled Sysmon, free tool from Microsoft that helps with data collection, and then also worked with Event Sentry, which is a, uh, it's not a free, but it's a, uh, it was the sim that we were working with uh, that was deployed there. And so writing detections for them, Event Sentry also released a blog post as a result of this. So that was kind of cool to see is that as a result of this purple team exercise, besides the obvious use case here that we increased detections from essentially zero to 64% in six weeks with measured detections on what was detected, what was blocked. And of course, the, the focus being on behaviors. And that's why we alternated those threat actors. And that's, that's a really great result for only six weeks of testing. And so that's something that is the power of purple teaming. And so if you do want to see the entirety of the talk, George and Bryson are both expert presenters. I highly recommend checking it out. And so here's the YouTube link. And to answer a question that may have already popped up, yes, this is being recorded. And yes, the slides will be available afterwards. So let's go into actually doing like, what is a purple team? What's our checklist? What do we need in order to do these things? You know, maybe you're like, Tim, this sounds great. How do we do it? So we need a couple of things on our purple team journey uh, in order to execute things. We're gonna need an ex exercise framework. We're gonna need something that sort of outlines what we're going to do for the purple team. With, and then to help fill out the details of that, we need cyber threat intelligence and an emulation plan. And then very last, we need emulation and reporting tools because again, we need to record what we're doing and we want to try and automate or at least use a framework that's going to emulate adversaries as closely as possible. So let's dive into these, starting with the exercise framework. So while Scythe and the one we'll be using has the Purple Team exercise framework, you can use any framework that you want that is specific to your industry. That's the great thing about purple teaming is it can be morphed, it can be uh, stretched and applied to your use case. And that's really what's important here is that we're going to go over some scenarios and some ways that we would do it. However, purple teaming is all about transparency and being able to apply testing that is extremely relevant to either your organization or your industry. And to have that really quick return on investment when it comes to test to detection. And so that's where, you know, we have our purple team exercise framework. However, we'll also acknowledge there's lots of other frameworks and methodologies out there. And so if there's one that you're familiar and comfortable with, highly recommend starting with that. And so to dive into it, I'm, I'll share really quickly. This is uh, site.io slash PTEF. If you want to follow along and download the framework. So with that, let's dive into what is actually in that. So I mentioned before, roles and responsibilities. This is something that's really crucial and, and I think is kind of unique in the way that George has outlined this framework. Because that's oftentimes the question. And that's, you know, when I was at MITRE, that was always the question with, with MITRE attack is like, how do we operationalize this? How do we use it? And so this is this specifies very specific roles. This specifies what they're doing and exactly how they're going to execute things. And I think that's something that, you know, George has a lot of experience with building out some of these standardizations and that was sort of all captured here. So let's dive into these. Head of security, you definitely need high, like super high level coverage if you're doing security testing or at least as high as you can uh, get within your uh, enterprise or organization, super important. Cyber threat intelligence, again, if you have a large organization that has separate teams, maybe you have a uh, cyber threat intel team and they can provide you a uh, specific TTPs or things like that, that they've been observing uh, with specific adversaries. If you have a, your own internal program, maybe you have some private internal data that can feed into your testing to make it even better. Red and blue team managers, again, just top level cover and to make sure that everyone understands exactly what this is about when you are doing a purple team exercise. This is, uh, this does require a lot of communication. It requires people to work together. And that's something that depending on how siloed those teams are is going to be either easier or harder to do. 
So with that, then we start diving into the actual teams participating. And so we have the red team. So this can be a person, for instance, uh, I run our services here at Scythe. And so I can be sort of a one person red team if necessary with our tool, as you'll see, and you will too. But this is going to require any preparation that needs to be done. Uh, if there are new domains uh, that need to be built or or aged, if you're doing trying to do something that's like a, uh, if you are trying to do like a blind purple team, which I haven't really heard of a ton of success of that, but I suppose you could do it. Uh, and, and so any preparation, that kind of thing that you would need to do with red team infrastructure is gonna fall on that person. Blue team, this, the key thing here is getting the right people in the room for the actual exercise itself. Because being able to say, all right, here's that escalation that we would do, as I mentioned earlier, that tier one, tier two, tier three, if the tier two and tier three people aren't in the room or only the two tier two and three, they're not going to understand what necessarily would, would happen for, for them to get the information that they're working off of. And that's really important to capture all of that. And so that's where I recommend having as many teams or at least participants from the teams uh, in the room as much as possible. And then the toughest role of all is the exercise coordinator. This is the person that is, you know, they can be a project manager. They can be uh, someone that you just hold in really high regard has is great at sort of leading and emceeing the purple team uh, engagement because that's essentially what they're doing. They're leading through things. They're explaining the TTPs. They are taking notes, action items. They're sending out reports like it is a lot to do. And so that's something that uh, it can be overwhelming the first time you do it, but as you do it more and more, then you'll get comfortable. But that's by far the hardest role. And if you're gonna be the big purple team advocate for your company, this probably person is going to be you the very first time. So time requirements. As I mentioned, start small. If you have never run one before, start with a single technique or a single procedure and purple team with just that one thing. And we'll show you how to do that. However, if you are an organization that, uh, or you work with people that do purple teaming, there's a chance that they can come in and do things for days, weeks, uh, months, I guess you could do. We have at the SANS Purple Team Summit, which happened two months ago, uh, I talked to a couple of folks that were your purple team managers in their company. So they were hiring and building out teams of just purple teamers at, at the time. And so I think that's something that we're going to increasingly see. And so that's where the time requirements for them, that is they show up every day and they do this. And so I think that's really, really cool. We'll talk about how that can have like massive impact in your organization, but that's where time is the main thing is getting all of those people together so that you can run one of these. So you can, you know, peel back the curtain of how everything's being tested, how everything's being detected and walk through it. So as much time or as little time as that's going to take. So through the pandemic, we've been mostly virtual, um, but also, you know, if you could get everybody into a conference room when, when, uh, when it's safe to do so, then that would be, you know, probably ideal is then you could have people, you know, go around and either plug in their laptop to the conference screen or something like that, because then folks can chat. It's all in the room. You know, that's something I know with Zoom, that's a little more difficult. If you do need to have multiple conversations, you can, you know, try and do breakout rooms or something like that. But overall, that's what we've done so far. And we found it to work quite well during, uh, during the pandemic. So that's where screen sharing is super important. That's what I'll emphasize from this last point. All right, testing in production. Uh, always get this question, especially since uh, we do a lot of ransomware emulations and people are like, oh, are you sure we, we can do that safely? Yes, we have people that you know have site, they do it every day in their production environment. Uh, we've built it so that that can be done. But the, the end goal of purple teaming is we want to test against all of the real controls in the environment. And so that's where it's crucial to put all of this in, in test in production. So if you build a test bed, it's not going to have all of the, uh, 
you know, little things that you have in your production environment because someone else is standing them up. Maybe the security people are going to put additional controls into place, things like that. And so those things are all going to skew the results of the tests. And this, you know, to again, get back where this is not meant to be an adversarial test. This is meant to be collaborative. It's meant to be uh, getting everyone together so they can work together for the betterment of the company. So ensuring that you can, you can set up separate uh, new accounts and things like that. But especially when you get into detection engineering, it's crucial to be able to uh, filter against the noise of the environment. Because if you build a detection in a lab, deploy it, and you go from you know one result to 15,000 results in an hour, that's going to be something that you can either just work on tuning that. But if you at least start and know that, OK, this starts with 15,000, I know I need to tune this down. What can I do? So just uh, different ways to test. We always recommend testing in production, especially when you're bringing in external people. So having that security stack is really important for understanding as we go through the purple team exercise and as we go through each like TTP, what is that expected result? Which piece of security uh, software is going to stop this? Is it going to be Windows? Is it going to be uh, a group policy? Those types of things are really important, and especially with EDR and all of that these days, and so many different tools that defenders are using, making sure that you record what each of them are allows you during the purple team to measure which tools are providing the value they think they are versus maybe some that are providing more or less. So it's really, again, about collecting all of that data as you go through this so that you can understand exactly what's working in your environment and what you might need to tune. So as far as scoping the tests, now we always recommend doing an assumed breach model, which means that you're testing against these last two. So this is the cyber kill chain. And so it's got a lot of different stages that folks have focused on and different products focus on. Where we like to uh, focus and play is on that assumed breach model because that's where ransomware is having its impact. That is where you potentially have some of the most control because that is all your environment where some parts of this are things that are going to be much, much harder to detect. Although for a really good defense in depth posture, it's going to be uh, required to test more than these. Purple teaming could be used to test all of them, but what we're gonna focus on at least in this presentation and in this lab is going to be those last two command and control and actions on objectives. So all of that being said, here's what the exercise flow looks like. And we're gonna walk through a direct example on how to do this. So this isn't the last time you're going to see this. The exercise coordinator is going to present a TTP. Then you're gonna have a tabletop discussion. This is crucial, this is crucial. And that's why I'm gonna say that twice. It's so important. One of the questions I always get from folks that we're training on how to do purple team exercise, especially if they have a red team background or a pen tester background, it's like, oh, if I tell them what I'm going to execute beforehand, what if they go and build a detection for it? Well, you win. Like overall, everyone wins. Like if if the something is caught and detected, that's great. Uh, you know, I that's what I like to say. I'll celebrate with you if if someone can go and write a bunch of detections, especially that work well against behave at the behavior level. Like that's that's a win. And so. That's why it's really important to capture what's supposed to happen and not just what's supposed to happen, what people expect to happen. So what security tool is going to catch this? What is it going, is it going to be an alert? Is it going to be informational? Understanding exactly what you are doing and, and what should happen is crucial to understanding if there are gaps in what a specific tool should be doing versus what it is doing. So we see, see that all the time. We'll run a we'll run one of these engagements we'll they'll say all right our edr is supposed to pick this up or and something else does instead you know we we're on one engagement where uh we were running the test and someone that wasn't even involved in our test sent an email to the SOC and was like hey i got this email alert that i set up four years ago when i was working with the SOC, and uh you know are you all doing something 
And so that was a person they didn't even know they, you know, could potentially rely on for stuff. And so they investigated into exactly what that person, you know, what alert they had. But that's why it's super important to record all these things. And so it's really deliberate flow as we go through this. And so that's where I say, start small, pick your one or two techniques, start with that, and then build your way up to an actual entire emulation plan. And so, like I said, we're gonna dive into each of those uh, a little bit later. So all of that said, exercise framework, check. We've got it. We are going to work with our purple team exercise framework. Next step, cyber threat intelligence and our emulation plan. So let's talk about CTI. We've touched on this a little bit. David Bianco's pyramid of adversary pain. And so this is how much pain can you inflict on adversaries if you are able to uh, essentially take in and use the types of information as, as addressed. And so hash values at the very bottom, they're trivial for defenders to add in. Most of the time, everyone has some sort of feed that just goes in, but it's also trivial for adversaries to evade these things. Uh, you know, it's as simple as changing a single byte uh, or bit in the binary or how they're building things. And especially with uh, sort of the automation we've seen with some of the adversary tooling, this kind of stuff changes even like per, per time it's deployed. So there's no guarantee that hash values really can, can do much for adversaries these days. And especially as we move up to IP addresses and domain names with cloud infrastructure, again, as scaling has happened on the information technology side, it's also uh, that works against us from an adversary perspective as well, because they've been able to take that. And so it's super easy to change out relays or to change uh, servers that are hosting the malware. And so that's why those start to be at least a little bit more irritating to an adversary, but it's still not that big of a hurdle. When we get into network and host artifacts and tools, those are things that, you know, if you're able to identify file paths and things like that, this is where you start to really take away from what the adversaries are able to do. And so something that I think is really interesting with this is that uh, you have to think of adversaries as, as people and teams too. They have deadlines, they have limited expertise that they have to leverage. Uh, they, you know, before ransomware essentially had limited funds. And so that was something that building new capabilities or having somebody on the team that was going to be a PowerShell expert instead of just running command line or changing and integrating new techniques into their tools was very, you know, that took time, effort, energy, and then to deploy it out wide so that it could be used all took time. And so that's why these are annoying and challenging is because it, this does start to require expertise to really start changing things out. And that's where we get to the top of the pyramid, which is what everyone's aiming for, which is tactics, techniques, and procedures. Now, this is where MITRE ATT&CK comes in, is a framework that essentially has identified all of these TTPs. And so we'll get to attack specifically in a minute, but I wanna talk about how we can use this diff these different levels of cyber threat intelligence to build out an emulation plan. So this is from a talk by Katie Nichols and Cody Thomas were my coworkers at the time. And so they built out and it looks very similar to the cyber kill chain, but this is essentially how you can build an emulation plan. So how you can take cyber threat intelligence and turn it into a test plan. And so we're gonna walk through at least a few of these when we're uh, talking, like I think at two slides, but to give you a quick highlight, understand your organization. Are you in financial, pharmaceutical, research, defense, something else? Those are all different potential targets. Adversaries tend to pick targets that are similar because that is either what they're tasked for or that's what they have the tooling to get around because of each industry has different types of regulations and, and setups. It means that their stacks, whether in technology, in, in cyber defense, are probably very similar. And so that means that adversary tooling will work well. If it works well against one, it's potentially going to work well against another. And so that's why looking at something as large as where is your, you know, who's targeting your industry, that's going to be something that's really important. 
So once you've done that and identified what area you're in, you can identify that specific adversary, whether for the financials, for instance, the fin actors were named because they target financial industries. So you can identify a specific adversary, go out, look for public reporting. This is again, a place where MITRE attack comes in because they cite all of the sources of their cyber threat intelligence and where they're pulling it from. And they only add things to attack that have been seen in public reporting. And then you're able to pull out those TTPs. You can put them together into a plan and then emulate the adversary. So let's dive into what some of those TTPs would look like. So if you've never seen MITRE attack before or just are sort of new to it, this uh, is a semi-updated version. So all of those uh, extra thick bars are for sub techniques that if we expand it out, wouldn't fit on the slide. But essentially the way to think about it is across the top there, recon, resource development, initial access, all the way through towards impact. Those are all tactics. This is a 10,000 foot view. This is the goals the adversary is trying to achieve. And so, like I said, really high level, this is going to be sort of the methodology of the adversaries. And then underneath each of those is going to be the techniques. And so each technique is going to be a technical means by which the adversary is achieving that goal. And so it may be that they're doing account discovery under discovery to try and understand who, you know, who are they able to compromise, who opened the email, who, you know, downloaded this specific thing. And with that, then you can go into, for some of them, it's, they have sub techniques now, which are sort of refined areas, especially for uh, specific techniques that were still very broad, like uh, credential dumping and all of the different ways that you can do that. It was a little bit too broad of a technique. So they broke those out into specific ones. And procedure is the most detail oriented version uh, and, and in the weeds in attack. And so that's going to say, like, for instance, for account discovery, maybe the adversary runs who am I? Uh, and so that's an exact command. You can, you know, paste that into your Windows command line and it'll execute. And so procedures are going to be, like I said, those nitty gritty things. And that's where depending on how you're building, if we go back to our pyramid of pain, if you're building things off of who am I instead of necessarily account discovery, there's a lot of different ways to gain information on whose account is running other than running the command who am I. And that's where trying to look at a different level of attack than just the procedure is going to allow you to have a better defense against that technique as a whole. So talked about extracting TTPs. How do we do that? So this is a screenshot from a slide from Katie and uh, Cody's presentation that they were going through a FireEye report. And so at the time, FireEye had some of these attack techniques, but it was still earlier on in the adoption. And so this was this is really good at just showcasing how you can break down as an analyst. You have to read through these things, extract out the techniques. And so that's something that uh, it can be a full-time job. In fact, it is. And so there's a lot of folks that are either on the attack team or that are in uh the cyber threat intelligence teams that are having to read through reports or read through different documents to understand adversary behaviors and break them out into some common language that before attack wasn't there. And so this is how you do it. And this is how attack gets populated. And so you would see citations on each of these uh, specific techniques. And so for instance, we have T1086, uh, which is PowerShell up here. And so there's a bunch of different things here that get pulled out. And then you'll see like the S numbers, these are software. So there are groups, there are software and techniques. Attack has a ton of great resources and we're gonna be using that throughout. And so if you haven't checked it out, they also have released like new trainings and stuff like that, free trainings. So highly recommend if you're not familiar with it, checking out Attack. All right, oh, I think I skipped one, yep. Yeah. All right, Attack Navigator. So this is a free tool for MITRE and it's a sort of way of mapping out exactly what you're testing. And so uh, you can color code these and they had uh, previously, they had something called stoplight charts, but overall the key thing here that I think Attack Navigator really excels at is communication at a high level. 
you can, I can look at this and even though there's a lot of things going on here, overall, I can see that there's a bunch of different tactics and techniques being tested here. And so as far as, you know, trying to communicate to senior management, or if you're a red team trying to send to your blue team, what you're planning on testing, and you want to give them at a high level, the behaviors look, you're looking to test, you could give them this. And so they can go and do their own research and stuff like that. We've done that before with red and blue interactions that isn't quite a purple team, but it's something that is using more communication. So that's where I think there's a lot of really good um, communication that can happen with like visualizations. And so any tool that helps with that, I think is, is really good. So analyze and organize, you've got all your techniques. How do you put them together into something that makes sense? So normally this is how we, in our threat Thursdays that I'll talk about in a second, uh, do it is we break it down by adversary description of who they are, what they are, if that attribution is there. Uh, the objective that they're trying to achieve is IP theft. Are they uh, trying to gain information for intelligence? Those types of things are really important to understanding how the adversary is going to try and achieve their goals because that's their overall mission objective. And then we go and break down for each of the tactics, the attack tactics that you'll see, the technique ID name and potentially details. So we at Scythe have released a ton of free public emulation plans that you can go see in our community threats GitHub page. We have blog posts that take five to 10 minutes maximum to sort of read and digest. And so we've, we've tried to make those something that are accessible to everyone. And so you can use those and leverage them in your own tests. You know, let us know if you run into any challenges or things like that. We also try and update some of the plans depending on uh, how things are released. And the reason I bring that up is like certain adversaries, some will change names as we're seeing with like ransomware families, but they also will have new variants. And so depending on how long an adversary is around, the threat intelligence that we initially used to build the adversary emulation plan might be a bit dated. And so we try and release new versions and we try and do these at, we've promised at least once a month, but 2021 has been unfortunately active with adversary behavior. And so we've been doing them two to three times. Uh, and I think we've even had one month where we hit that four weeks in a row. So check it out, follow us on social media for uh, keeping up with the latest ones. These are always released, like I said, uh, at least on some Thursdays of the month. So we're gonna dive into Orange Worm. Orange Worm, uh, and just like looking into what it does. You'll get to test this and run this in the lab as well. So you'll get, you'll get to be as familiar with this as you want. But basically the idea behind this slide is just to show you how a real one is broken down. We have our adversary, we have a description, they targeted healthcare organizations, and it looked like, you know, corporate espionage was a big thing. And so we break down each of the techniques. The nice thing about the techniques as well, sort of, uh, I guess, preview is that these are going to determine what types of tools you need in order to emulate them. So that's why it's really important that you have these outlined because then you can go and say, all right, I need a tool that does this, or I need a tool that does this other technique. And maybe those are two different tools, maybe they're the same. Uh, but overall, this is going to guide how you're going to be testing. So with that, we have now finished our cyber threat intelligence. We have an emulation plan that we're going to work with when it comes to Orange Worm. And now let's get into reporting and emulation tools. So we have good old fashioned Microsoft Excel or your favorite other note taking application as the like standard uh, bar for, for reporting. But we also have a couple of others that are newer to the scene that are something that, especially when it comes to purple teaming, have really tried to embrace that. So Vector is a tool, again, that's in the lab. It's free, it's uh, by, let's see, SRA, which is I think Security Risk Associates. And I might have the A wrong on that. So uh, people can double check me. But overall, they've released this tool. You'll get to uh, at least see how it works in, uh, in the lab. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. But then we have PlexTrack is a company that's come along here in the last year, their paid tool, um, but they've they've really tried to emphasize the purple teaming aspect of it. 
And, uh, you know, we, we've partnered and worked with them on integrations with Scythe. And so it's another, it's a great tool and one that I often use for our professional services reporting. So it's all about recording what you've done as well as being able to provide those metrics. And that's really what we're looking for in effective tools. So uh, security risk advisors, thank you so much. So this is a quick screenshot of, uh, that's maybe a little bit blurry depending on your screen resolution. Uh, and so this overall, what I wanna show you in Vector is that you have the red team side and the blue team side. And so you have, an outline of what the red team executed and the blue team can say whether something was detected. They can outline what specific tools were used to detect it and then whether there was any alert with any severity. And then you can put in any notes you want. And this is a really nice way of recording things. Again, this is a very deliberate uh, process and something that we're all working on making easier and more automated, but that's just something that uh, is it's really important to record all these things because then you're able to you know sort of understand where you stand in this snapshot in time that you're testing. So it's Plex Track, and again, similar interface in that it's got the specific TTPs. I don't have another screenshot here, but they also have a red and blue side where you can say whether or not the when you executed it, the red team was successful. And then you also can have that outcome on the blue team side, whether it was logged, detected, and then you can fill out additional notes. And so it's really nice from that aspect to have something besides Excel that you can uh, record these in and help create some nice looking visualizations and trend tracking and reporting. So as far as documentation, the last sort of note that I've got on this is bringing back the exercise coordinator role. I said it was probably the hardest role and it really is because these are the people that have to record everything. They have to go through it all, record whether or not something was blocked, record whether the red team was successful in executing it, uh, explain what the TTP is doing, at least uh, sort of introduce it. If maybe the red team has more details to add, they can do that. But overall, the key thing here is that they're the driver. And so that means that they are gonna be the one that's recording everything in either one of these tools or Excel or something else if you have a, a favorite reporting tool. So they're gonna be responsible for sending out lessons learned at the end of each day, maybe any action items if it's a multi-day or multi-week test. And so at the end, you know, sort of as you're seeing here, would we ask for feedback? Uh, they should also ask for feedback because part of, again, purple teaming is trying to figure out how to speed up this process. Your organization may have specific things that they can't do, won't do, or that are just uh, slowing down because of your processes. And so you're like, maybe we don't want to have those in our first couple of purple team engagements. And so those types of requests should be fed back to the exercise coordinator. All right, emulation tools. We got a quick sip of water here. All right, so let's start off with the all the tools. So determining tools to use, as I mentioned before, those techniques that you want to test are going to help determine what tools you want to use. And so wouldn't it be nice if there was some website that would tell you what things had what? Uh, welcome to the C2 matrix. And so this is essentially a massive Excel uh, table that's maintained by uh, open source contributors. I think we've got a couple different Scythe is also a contributor, George, Bryson. Uh, we've got some folks from Red Canary, Adam, and I think a few others. And I'm sorry, I don't have all of your names at the top of my head. But basically, this is an, uh, this is an open source effort that is maintaining all of these different command and control frameworks that come out. And if you follow enough people on Twitter, you can like see these things get released like weekly sometimes daily for a little while there, but overall it has a comparison tool. And this includes Scythe on here as you can maybe see. And so this is what is going to allow you to say, all right, is this the tool I need? What are the things I wanna test? And you can figure out exactly how it will work. So, and this is what's installed in the Slingshot VM in your, um, in your lab. 
So this is a Scythe Purple Team Workshop. So I am going to talk a little bit about Scythe, which is an enterprise grade platform for adversary emulation. So you'll get to play with it in the lab. So I don't wanna to spend too much time on here, but just wanna highlight that we're really focused on these behaviors that we've talked about. Everything that I've talked about with Purple Teaming, we have basically distilled that down into a tool. And so you'll get to play around with it, see how it can be a force multiplier in the automation. Uh, so I'm not gonna spend too, too much time on this. And let's see, I've talked about integrations. We have heat map reporting for MITRE ATT&CK that you'll get to see, so we'll keep rolling. So now we've got everything that we want to do for our purple team. Now the question always comes like, well, what's next? Um, so let's put it all together. Exercise flow, bringing this back because this is exactly where we're gonna start at. So going with orange worm, one of the very first things that are uh, the very first technique that gets executed is running with command line host name. So we have cyber threat intelligence. You know, this is the way to do the like very verbose reporting for when it comes to purple teaming. And so citing your cyber threat intelligence, give a lot of credit for uh, the MITRE attack evaluations. They cite their sources for every single procedure they do. Like that is like the pinnacle of, of going through and having these really, really in-depth high fidelity emulations is being able to cite your cyber threat intelligence. And it's not something you're potentially going to be able to do for every single exercise. Or if you're uh, if you're catching up on my blog post, the adaptive emulation that I did earlier uh, this uh, last week, or no, it was this week, sorry. Uh, so on Monday talks about how you can morph these things to make it a little bit more difficult. And so that's something that you know, you're not always going to be able to cite it, but that's something that you should always uh, aspire to is be able to tie this back because when you can tie it to real cyber threat intelligence, either a real adversary or a real piece of malware, it adds significant weight to your test and allows you to essentially say, this specific adversary has done this, we tested against it and we didn't detect it. That's a really, that's a nice story that allows you to either get the time resources to go and potentially fix that gap. So the other thing, as I mentioned, that sort of tabletop that happens at the beginning, expected result, expected response, these things should be filled out. And so that's what we're gonna do. So if you remember, if we go back up, so we're going through that tabletop first. And so we'll say that uh, whoever we're evaluating here says, all right, we're expecting logging of the command and the prim uh, parameters. So we'll be able to see everything uh, but it's, I mean, hosting. So this is something that, you know, could be a benign. And so just trying to alert on that is, is going to flood our sock. And so that's, that's not something we want. So we'll say that it's something we can hunt for afterward, but I don't think that it should, you know, spawn an alert. And maybe if it does, you know, that's going to be, that's going to be a gap. So once we've done that, you're going to have the red team execute the procedure. So this is a screenshot of Scythe. It's the run module, which is running CMD, taxi, and hosting. So when that's done, big question, what happened? And so uh, up to this point, we've been completely transparent with the blue team though, when we're going through this, we're saying, this is exactly what we're executing. Here's the process ID. You know, this is something you can have the process ID so that they can go and look for it to see what they're detecting. I'm not, you know, right right now, as I've been doing a bunch of purple team exercises, I'm not on the, uh, not quite on the, hey, here, you know, I executed, see if you can find something. I like to be really transparent because I want to start diving into those details on why something did or didn't flag, not on whether or not the defender can find it. And so, if they can't find it and I'm giving them all the information, there's a chance that it's just not collected as a log, which is potentially, depending on the technique, is a major gap. So I wanna identify those types of uh, gaps as soon as possible because those are, require potentially new tools like Syswan or something like that uh, for them to go in and get through their enterprise or organization's approval process. So let's try and identify those big gaps as soon as possible. 
So again, screen sharing, having people uh, talk back and forth, maybe they would say, you know, this is not, this is something that our, our tier one really only looks at our border stuff. It's our tier two team that looks internal at, you know, suspicious processes being run. And so this would be our tier two. And so we'd switch over to that. They would say, you know, maybe we decided to go through a hunt or something else potentially, you know, allowed this to alert. And so now I'm going to search for the process ID. So getting into detection engineering. So we're just going to sort of highlight a, a way to go through this cycle, because this is something that doesn't happen every purple team engagement. And I'll tell you why. So when we come into an organization and we're doing, uh, we're doing a purple team exercise, depending on the size of the organization and the skill set of the people they have, uh, as well as the tools they have, detection engineering is not always possible. So detection engineering takes a bunch of time, effort, energy. If you don't have somebody that has a detection engineering background or is actively doing it, it can be incredibly difficult to put them on the spot and say, hey, write a detection right now for this. You know, we're all waiting and then we're going to test it. Uh, you know, ideally that's going to be the environment that you have is you have that person sitting on the call that can say, all right, you know, I can go write this either, you know, put this Splunk query or Elk query into a, you know, a dashboard and sort of build something out. It's not always possible. It may not happen during that purple team engagement. And so this is a part that we always recommend doing this because that way, if you do have that person, they can run through it. You can test it again and see if you get that expected result and then move on. But that's where I like to at least introduce people. Uh, Olaf Hartong is uh, just an amazing person in, in that he's released so many tools and, and Falcon Force as a whole has released this. So this is a slide from uh, one of Olaf's uh, talks about resilient detection engineering. And so uh, his process, you know, he's the, he is, an expert in this area on it. Uh, and so that's where, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. That's another big thing with purple teaming is that if someone has a really good tool or technique uh, or way of tackling something, I always recommend, you know, use that first before you start customizing your own. And so we're going to walk through how we would do this detection engineering cycle. And uh, for this very, uh, hopefully simple, execution. So first step is hypothesizing. And so I've broken everything out. So we, we maintain what each step is when we're trying to think about it. So we've got this uh, command line host name execution. And so what are we looking for with this? Well, we have an attack technique ID. So it's T1082 system information discovery. So that's something to see if you're a defender, do we, it, do we map what we have to MITRE ATT&CK and all of the detections and things that we do? Is that something that we say we cover? Probably. Uh, so a lot of discovery stuff, the challenge with it, of course, is that you have system administrators that are potentially going to run this type of stuff uh, or scripts or things like that that are all benign or, or part of your IT infrastructure that are going to execute these things. And so the other questions here is like the execution method, command line. Can we detect that? Do we have the data sources? Uh, is it going to be something like system on EDR, uh, or is it going to be Windows event log? And then in addition to detecting command line execution, can you detect specific arguments? So this is something I never would have thought would be as common as I've seen, is that we've oftentimes seen that uh, a tool will have that command line was executed and then they will have no other information. So it has happened. And, you know, a lot of times this is either tuning or, or enabling additional features, but that's something that's super important because if you just see command line is executed, you have no visibility into what it's doing. With that, investigating research. So can we detect this? Well, what information methods can we use to gain the information? As I mentioned before, looking at data sources. MITRE has, uh, the MITRE attack team released this year as part of their, their breaking down their 2021 roadmap, was trying to allow people to operationalize it 
better. And so part of that was understanding how to build detections for specific techniques. And so as part of that, they've introduced a updated data source data sources section to each of the techniques. And so you can see, I've got a screenshot here uh, of one, which was, I think for, what is it, 1082? Yep. And so when, when you're looking for that, that's, these are the data sources, you know, can you look for command execution? Can you look for OS API execution? This one tends to be much more difficult, but we're not, we're, we're only executing this with the command line. And so that's where I said, how can you get those? And we already have a way that we're going to execute it. So we're going to do the uh, CMD taxi host hostname. But if you are looking at broadening this to the specific technique, you're going to want to look at other ways that adversaries might gain this information. PowerShell, for instance, uh, you know, is there environment variables? There's other things that are going to be less of an execution and more of, you know, pulling something that's already there. So. Those are all different ways that you can sort of stress test this cycle as you're building through it. So analytics and developing uh, sort of a wide net for this. This can be, do we want to look for all new processes from uh, cmd.exe? Well, that's potentially going to generate a ton of different results, lots of false positives. It's probably not the route you want to go down. Do we want to look for anything that has host name in the arguments? You know, this is going to be something that uh, there, you know, there are best practices to follow in this uh, in, in trying to make sure that you are detecting again on those behaviors, but it's how you can tune those behaviors to your environment. If there's some specific set of flags or something like that, that you can tune to your environment that may not work anywhere else, but it, it works for you and you can validate that, that that's going to be a valid way of, of narrowing this down. And so that's where, you know, I'm sort of speaking in generalities here because it is going to depend on your environment and how you're doing this. And so that's really what detection engineering comes about, comes down to is what tools do you have access to? What data do you have access to to then perform analysis on? And so then we'll get into, you know, that research portion is like you've executed things, was it detected? Do you have the data sources? Can you look at building detections on, on this information alone, right? This snapshot of command line executing host name. Is there anything else that we could add to the context that would make it instantly malicious? For instance, if you start tying this with like metadata on or, or additional information on what executed it, was it a, a new command that got spawned, right, by another process? Uh, and so from a parent process ID perspective, can you add some additional analysis and information to it that would provide you with less false positives in the event that something like this was executed? And so that's where this, you know, keeping it resilient, it's really important to, to make sure that, you know, if people start changing things on it, when, do you, when is that going to break? And you need to understand when that's potentially going to happen. And so that's where we get into this whole testing to detection engineering process. And then reporting and revising. So this is where we're going to tie back to our purple team exercise framework in that we're trying to measure, you know, was this detected? Was, uh, was the scope what we thought it would be? And, you know, either you can report it to management in this, in this uh, case, but we're going to tie it back to our exercise coordinator recording results. And so instead of just the expected results, we have verified that sysmon logging of the command line and the parameters was able to capture it, you know, through then ID one is, is what we were able to grab it through and there was no alert. So we verified the result, we've recorded it. Now we can move on to the next one. And so that's where you go through this over and over and over again. And so if it seems like, you know, it's, it's it's a structured format to go through testing and you know it it can feel sometimes like maybe it's it's a bit too structured and and there's not a lot of wiggle room but i promise starting starting with this and then working your way through through a couple of different exercises you'll get a feel for what works for you and what doesn't and that's where you can start to break out so what's next let's talk really quickly about the purple maturity model because i'm already 
slightly over an hour here with the, and I want to get you all into the lab. So the purple maturity model, this is how you are going to be able to bring purple teaming to a more like strategic point in your organization. And so we've got three levels. We've broken purple teaming down from those like red team, blue team, cyber threat intel into two different things, detection understanding and threat understanding. And so can you understand what the threats are doing and understand how to detect these things? We've broken it down into three different levels. So it's measurable. You know, that's something that I think is really important is being able to have a model that you can measure your team against. And so if you are just deploying, for instance, your SIM or deploying an adversary emulation tool, that alone is only going to put you at the first level. And so then are you able to combine that, integrate it with other tools in order to achieve a greater result? That greater result could be that you only have to look at one interface instead of two. It doesn't have to be something that's uh, you know a heroic combining of everything and, and now one person can do five, although that would be great. And so overall, what this is meant to do is trying to allow you to scale your team with your integrations whether it allows you to search more queries, whether it allows you to, to comb through things faster uh, or, or write detections quicker because you have better integration between your testing tool and your detection tools. All of that stuff is really important. And then we hit sort of the pinnacle of each side is creation. And so can you create novel threats or techniques or detections that are going to be catered and tailored to your environment and that requires deploying something, normally having it integrated, and basically taking that combination of things in order to adapt to the current adversaries uh, that we're seeing as they're unfortunately evolving rather quickly. And so basically, what we've seen is that lots of teams have detection understanding, and not a lot of teams have a threat understanding. And so that's where it's really important to have a balance because if you have a lot of detections but can't validate what's going to happen when they go off or that they're going to execute and, and alert you successfully, then that's, that's a major problem because it's essentially security theater, so to speak, because you're not actually sure what's going to happen. If you can validate it and ensure that it's working as expected, then that's where you want to be. And so it adds that much more weight to your defensive security posture. So I do have like a whole, you know, 30 minute talk on it, um, you know, and a blog post for those of you that like to read instead. So you can check out my, um, my social media. And with that, let's jump into hands on time. Also mention. We, we have a lot of really cool swag here at site. That's one of the awesome things about working for the company is, you know, it's, we hand we like to hand out good swag. We have a swag store that's open. Uh, and so you can go check it out. All, uh, you know, proceeds are donated to saving the chubby unicorns, also known as rhinos. So we've got like a, I think we had like a spring and summer collection. So check it out. And with that, I am going to swap my shares. So the way we're going to do the hands-on portion is we are going to have a, uh, like, basically, if you've ever been to, like, a science class or something like that, I'm going to walk through a couple of steps and talk about things you know, provide some commentary beyond just being able to read it. But, uh, but from there, we're then going to, I'm going to pause, you know, for 10, 15 minutes, let you all start doing things. And then, then we'll get, we'll get going. So let me grab this. All right. And my lab time is my Mine is building now. So it's going to take it a second. Any questions so far about the lecture content, lab content? Is there anything I know Elaine has been working with everyone in the background that's been having some challenges getting the links and everything working? So it's always everyone's a little bit different when it comes down to it. Um, but it looks like for the most part, everything's going well. If you don't have a lab link or you haven't 
haven't gotten in, don't be silent. You know, join the rest of us. Let us know. We're here to help. Yeah, I promise it's not a, you know, it's not something bad. If you can't get your, if you don't have your lab link, let us know in the chat. Um, or I think through Q&A is maybe how Elaine was tracking it. So, all right. I have got mine going. All right. So I've got a big screen here. And so I can sort of stretch everything out to, to sort of show you around VMware Learning Platform for those of you that haven't seen it before. So you have your manual up here uh, in the top right. These things can get hidden away, especially if you're on like a laptop screen. The first time I ever did a Scythe workshop, George was teaching it and I couldn't figure out how to get my manual back. Um, so now I always try and show everybody because it happened to me. And if, if it comes away, you can just click it again and it'll pop back out. So there are four different uh, things. However, you only have access to two. Uh, you can go and, you know, the domain controller and stuff like that are, are going to be there. You can interact with these things, uh, but that's where, you know, you can only, only uh, log into two of them. You can really only, you can, uh, you can work entirely from the unicorn one console here, the Windows machine, you can do everything you need to from it. So you don't actually need to mess with that. So I highly recommend you just hide, hide the console. Uh, and so question, another question I always get is, um, oh, there it is, uh, is notes. And like, how do I log in? Click on notes. Notes is your, your uh, light in the darkness. If you ever get like, uh, caught up and you know you're you're not sure where the login information is notes is always here with all the logins you need for the entire lab so that's something that i think is is super important uh and i always get questions on it like every every time so use the notes notes are your friend this and this can be accessed regardless of what other things you have on here so if we have student and so if you're not sure, go check the notes. Or if you're a pen tester, you try username and password, it turns out to be the same. All right, I think we've got a few questions. All right, how long does a purple team session take on average? Also, do you do the tabletop in the same meeting as the emulation or are they separate days? All right, great questions. So on average, we do a single adversary emulation plan in one day. And so, but we also will typically do, uh, we will typically do the tabletop beforehand. So as part of what we end up doing with, and the way we do services at Scythe is uh, you're working with me and I will say, I will say, all right, what are, what adversary do, do we want to, and we'll, we'll sort of have an initial planning meeting to go over the specific adversary. If it's one we already got, great. I can set, I send you the exact procedures and say, here's what we're going to test. Is there anything here that's problematic? You know, for instance, sometimes people do testing with Mimi cats on their own in their own environment. They don't want to potentially expose real credentials during uh, during a purple team engagement uh, with us when they they're already doing their own testing on that. And so that's fine. You can very quickly, as you'll see, change those things with Scythe. We remove those and we agree to those TTPs. We'll then have a second meeting that this is before we're running anything. This is all just recording information. And we'll ask the SOC, here's how we're executing this. This is what the procedure is. What is that expectation? And we'll go through and record all of those. And that takes one to two hours to do that. Uh, and then afterward, we will go through uh, the day of and we go one procedure at a time. We execute it manually the very first time and say, here's what we're doing. All right, we're executing. We record the result. Like, did you see it? Where was it logged? What product was the one that either logged it, alerted on it, stopped it? And, and that's how we go through our testing. So great questions. Um, let's see. So more Q&A. All right. We have, what is the diamond model in threat intelligence? All right, so the diamond model is like its own uh, its own separate thing. That's a great, 
great point that I should include that on future ones. I don't have sort of a bunch of content for you on that. And, and it's sort of its own thing. I will recommend Sands has a fantastic like uh, poster. And I think they release all their posters uh, for free that you can go and download that breaks down the diamond model and all the different points. And so uh, I'd highly recommend that. 